Everybody listen to We Are Not Wizards. Because we are the best. And we're not wizards. No matter what anybody says. Goodbye. <laughs> Hello and welcome to another episode of We Are Not Wizards. My name's Richard. I'll be your host for... Is it October? The spooky season. The scary season. The kind of the season... They call it the season of the witch. They call it the season of the untamed. They can call it the season of darkness and dampness and the season of maybe not cleaning your bathroom properly, not cleaning your shower properly, and then maybe letting it infest to the point where you not only get a little bit of grime, but you start to get a little bit of mould. And if you're unlucky, you start to get a little bit of black mould. Mm-hmm. And when that happens, there's only one thing to do. You've got to build, bring yourself on an expert. <laughs> and I don't want a good expert. I want a terrible expert. I want somebody who specialises in doing terrible things, making terrible <laughs> So from terrible games yeah. to talk about black mold. <laughs> yeah, baby. Hey, thanks for having I've me. I've got John DeCampos. Yeah, let's do it, man. <laughs> let's talk about fungal growths. So, um when is it you first started collecting fungal growth and, and do you remember? Oh uh, <laughs> this would have been this what age you Yeah, were? yeah. This would have been back in uh twenty oh one, right when I was getting out of high school, you know. Uh, we had a uh-huh. lot of um, a lot of experimentation happening around that age, and really just mm. started to connect with the mycelium hive mind, and start to really get deep into the practices of the fungal thralls. You know, uh, just just spreading our blight around and uh, trying to drive everybody insane. Those are the days, you See, know, mine, the golden uh, years. The golden years. Mine was slightly different. It was uh, it just happened on happenstance, and it happened to be um, an accidental leaving of a jam sandwich in a lunch pack that then got pushed to the back of the cupboard until after the summer holidays, um, and then it was discovered and um, it attacked five and uh, left two injured. But you know um, that's what happens mm-hmm. when jam sandwiches, Can't, in essence, go bad. Yeah, don't so. don't let that stuff get away from you. It can it can get out of control really <laughs> fast. Do you know what I love about this is I've taken this in a direction and you've also just joined me on this direction and ran with it because you could just be sitting there going, we've never actually spoken to each other. What the <laughs> hell are you actually doing? So it's always good when somebody kind of like takes the takes up the mantle where I've thrown it and decides they're going to kind of join in at the same time. That's always kind of pretty good. Um, anyway, how are you, John? I'm doing all right. Well? I'm doing all right. Yeah, I'll get, quickly I'll give you some side background. Um I'm part of an improvisational comedic Dungeons and Dragons troupe called Whose Role Is It Anyway, where um, kind of taking the ball and running with it is all part of the gig. You know what I mean? <laughs> I like to hear that. Yeah, that makes me that makes me very. Yeah, we very just happy. we just had a show actually on Friday and went very well. Um, I'm in the pre-campaign blender, uh, getting ready for mm-hmm. our release on Kickstarter on October 20th. Uh, so just kind mm-hmm. of spot checking a lot of different things. Um, kind of feeling a little guilty because i should probably be working more uh and uh yeah but otherwise you know holding it down getting ready for the aforementioned spooky season do you do the thing where you change your name on twitter no i'm I'm barely present on twitter i have an account simply to have it if i ever get the time or the motivation to engage there but social media already uh is is a it's a it's a tall order to stay to stay active and present there as it is you have to be kind of be up there. I mean, you're running a Kickstarter campaign, John. I mean, there's not. Yeah. You can't escape. You can't escape it. You have to be kind of. I mean, as much as it's like it is like going back to the fully moldy kind of jam sandwich. You have to kind of know, I've got to touch this thing to kind of get rid of it. So you kind of you know I'm going to poke it with a knife and and stuff like that. I, 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 there are some people who totally love it. I do get people that like. I see them. They 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 like change the name, the avatar, the photograph. They go into this inktober stuff as well which is like drawing uh yeah 
yep. drawing something kind of like every day, but like on a on a completely kind of monochromatic kind of thing. Did you? Did were you never tempted to do what? To do, do Inktober. That? Inktober, yeah. Oh, I've done it. Uh, I back oh, yeah. back when I first started, when I was still doing stuff in traditional medium. Um, I used to do mm. I used to do a series of watercolors, uh, and I did I did a couple monthly challenges uh, back back when I first got started. It's a great way to mm-hmm. build your audience, and also like it's a great exercise as an illustrator. Like if you're if you're doing artwork and you can and you can allow yourself the time and uh, and patience to do a monthly a daily prompt for thirty days. It's it's a, mm-hmm. it's a really good practice to sharpen your skills and get into a good workflow. Um, but like I said, you know, we got this Kickstarter coming up, so I really don't have time for that stuff right now. <laughs> but you are an, a bit of an illustrator yourself, though, yeah? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, so I all, all the stuff that Terrible Games has released, um, I am the uh, illustrator behind it for the time being. We are going to release a game, hopefully in the late spring, that's going to be done mm-hmm. by a, uh, an Australian illustrator named Brooke Pembrose, who's really quite good. All right. Cool. Is that what you do for a job job, or you do... Do you do something else for a job job? Um, illustration is what I do for a job job. Uh, but I'm also like a stay at home dad. So like my the income, oh. I, the income I make from doing illustration work is just sort of supplemental. Um, my partner uh-huh. luckily is in a position where, you know, she can she can cover the bulk of like any financial uh, responsibilities that would like, you know, make us homeless or not have heat on so, you know that that kind of stuff yeah, yeah, yeah um yeah. so you know i i have a lot of fortune and um and I, I really do appreciate the privilege i have to actually be able to just say like you know i've knocked out a couple commissions i got you know a, a couple hundred bucks in the bank to kind of take care of a couple things so i'm just going to work on my board game mm-hmm. stuff for a week or two weeks or do whatever i need to do Mm-hmm. So theoretically, so did you were you are you were you professionally trained for that? Did you go to college? I dropped out of college in the states to kind of do that. Yeah, I went did to you? I went to community college for two years and uh, didn't uh. didn't really didn't really dig it. Didn't like it. I kind of wish I had stayed in school or done made some a, a number of different decisions coming out of high school. But uh, yeah, this is where I'm at. Yeah, I dropped out of college and um, been doing just freelance illustration for the last seven years. Wow. So what kind of stuff, because I'm, I'm a little bit of an artist. <laughs> that sounded so kind of big head. That's well. <laughs> it's like, a, what's this? I'm kind, I'm kind of like the Willem Dafoe. Hey, I'm a little bit of an artist myself. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, um, yeah, but I, I kind of I kind of appreciate anybody that kind of like takes pen to paper or paint, you know, paintbrush to canvas or whatever. So, I mean, is it is is the artwork that you do is it is it any bearing to the kind of the stuff that we you actually have on the on the on the game Black Mold? Then is it close or are you doing kind of more kind of corporate graphic design type of stuff? Uh, no, definitely not that. Um, I don't I don't actually have enough of a refined skill set to meet the um the super polished super workshopped uh you know um committee Mm. uh, committee approved stuff that you see in like large quantity mainstream publications um i've Uh I've kind of adopted this mindset that like people will resonate with what we are doing or they won't and it's okay if they don't like not everything needs to be for everybody and we're all right being in that lane okay so what's your kind of your medium of choice then i haven't actually done a lot of physical media in quite a long time i got a i got an an apple uh i got an ipad with procreate installed on it i started messing with it and the versatility and the the depth of editing you can do and all of the different capabilities it is just like streamlined my workflow to an insane degree and like i i stopped Uh doing stuff in physical media so everything's digital i i've never taken the full jump Um, i kind of like I like the pen and the pencil and I like the kind of the sketching stuff and I like the, do you know what I also like? I like the permeability because I do a lot of my stuff in pen. So I know once it's there, it's very, very difficult to kind of take it away. And the problem with me is, is that I keep wanting to change something as well, Mm -hmm. which is why I'll never design a board game because I'll kind of get halfway through and I'll never finish it because I'll always be changing it. And I like the idea that once I put a mark on a paper with a pen, I can't. It's very, very difficult for me to get rid of it. And I know if I switch to a digital medium, 
I'd never finish a picture because I would always be pressing the back button to change, change yeah. stuff. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you. That's, you know, I think that that's sort of at the core of the discussion about whether or not like uh, traditional artists or fine artists are more of an artist than people who do stuff purely in digital form because there is a mindset to the permanence and the individual piece that you're working on when it physically exists versus something where mm -hmm. like, yeah, if you get two, th two thirds of the way through in an idea on a digital sketch and you just hate it, you can delete the layer and start over. Uh, you're not going to like fight. Yeah. You're not going to fight for that vision you had in your head and you're already an hour and a half in. So you figure out a way to make it work yeah. because you're not going to just ditch that that sheet. You know what I mean? Like there there definitely is a lot of value to the physical side of, of doing art. It's just for work mm -hmm. purposes. Uh, the digital stuff is, you know, I can set resolution. I know that stuff is going to be like good for commercial print. Um, I have a yeah. lot, of, you know, a lot of editing. So especially in the board game design space, if I have a thing that I need to change, like I need to, you know, switch around some icons on a card or mess around with the framing or figure something out like that. I can just go in and change it. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. One of the things that's coming up and I think you've actually commented this on yourself is the big AI art debate where people are putting up kind of huge pictures and saying, look, I put some ideas into a machine and this is what it came up with. And uh, that's led to a lot of artists kind of going, this isn't, this isn't right. This is literally allowing potential theft of kind of real artwork by if you put in enough kind of correct parameters. Where where do you sit with that as somebody with like you know this is your trade? Uh, how do you view the kind of the AI or kind of art movement? Um, I I am I am purposely trying to not say the words AI art because I don't I don't think that it's actually art. I I would say that it's machine learned mm -hmm. images or AI generated images. Uh, yeah, okay. they, they basically do amount to theft because of the way that the algorithms work. There's a case to be made that maybe the actual like code that governs the way that the AI generates the images is art, which I would consider that maybe a valid argument, although I don't really know what kind of work goes into doing actual code writing. Yeah. Um, as I mean, I, I actually I recently did had a conversation with uh, Jesse Anderson on his uh, on the Quackalope YouTube channel. We talked about it for about 45 minutes. And um, yeah, there's quite a few comments where people were straight up telling me that I'm not an artist because I don't embrace what what AI generated images mean for the art world. And uh, mm. yeah, I just I look at um, I look at illustration or really any visual art kind of being focused through the lens of experience and um, sacrifice and introspection and emotion and when i think about what what art means to me something that has the potential to evoke something in someone else maybe share a part of yourself with someone else without you actually being there explaining anything anything to them i don't think that yeah. computers can do that period i just i don't i don't think that i don't think that uh images generated from a series of words that are through a through a prompt bar i don't think that they have the ability to um to transport you to another place or give you any insight into a creator's like world or their mind or what they're feeling when they make things. Cause they're, it's just detached. It's, it's, it's just not associated with what that means when you make actual art. I used to draw people. So somebody would say to me, I want to be, I want to be Titus from final, you know, final fantasy, or I want to be, um, Earthworm Jim, or I want to be, you know, this character or that character. So I used to draw them as video game characters. And it wasn't just a Photoshop job where I was taking their face and I was actually, you know, taking a picture. I used to draw the whole thing from hand kind of thing. And there was a little bit of my input into it alongside kind of their input into it, my interpretation of what they kind of look like as that character. And you could probably do something like that in AI and you would get an acceptable thing, but I don't think, as you would say, I don't think you kind of get the soul that comes along it. It looks, I mean, some of the stuff I've seen is very, very stunning, but I can't go to that AI program and ask them to explain to me what they were thinking or feeling at the time, why they shaded this thing this way, why they shaded it that way, why they proportioned it that way, why they used this even particular kind of digital medium kind of thing. And I think that's kind of what misses it. I think AI artwork is kind of like an interesting thing. Yeah. But for them to try and push it as kind of like, this is the next big thing, I kind of get it. I think it's the big thing for this part of the year. 
Um, and I think the only people that are really going to push it are the folk that can see a way of trying to cut artists out of the equation. But I, I don't think it'll ever... I don't think I'll ever 100% take away. It's the same way as, that's why you still get people, you know, we've got digital art now, but we still get people kind of painting with watercolours and oils because, you know, I see TikTok videos of guys like drawing full pictures using biros, ballpoint pens and stuff like that, you know, and that's, and, and, and you could literally take a photograph of the exact same image and you could muck around with it and Photoshop it and get something that looks, you know, just as good. But the reason that people love their art is because they know of this, the work, the hard work, and everything like that that's kind of gone into it in the background. Yeah, and that's that's my take. That's my kind of my, my kind of kind of my, my kind of take on it. Yeah, I agree. You know, um, a lot of the conversation that Jesse and I had sort of revolved around the application of AI generated images as it could be used within the tabletop board game space. And hmm. for an indie publisher who has really really low resources, who doesn't have an artistic bone in their body, but knows how to design a game and knows how to write a rule booklet, they're probably sitting there thinking, "Great, now all I need to do is pay ten dollars a month to have access to this AI generation system, where I'll be able to pump out all the art assets I need." And, you know, that's fine for prototyping. I just think you, you get into some really morally and um, kind of weird areas when you start thinking about trying to sell that commercially because the AI images are borrowing from everything that exists on the Internet. And that's artwork yeah. that's produced by actual people who did not give their permission for their things to be used in that way. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. It's it's real tricky. Um, if it If it advances to the point where it's indistinguishable from human made artwork uh that could be very weird maybe cool i'm not really sure maybe bad maybe. but i mean you're a, you do you you're a bit of a musician as well so you could argue that well what about all these hip hop you know what about the beastie boys sampling stuff what about you know nwa and public enemy sampling stuff and it's like well that's different because they're taking a specific thing but you can still recognise the original piece that they took it from, and nine times out of ten, they're kind of crediting where they actually got the sample from in the first place. Well, yeah, and also, like, you know, thinking about using audio samples in hip-hop is really just a very, very... It's a really good analogue for just how art works. There isn't... I don't think that there's any art or music or anything that is created by people that doesn't borrow from previous work. You can't... I mean... The idea of, you know, I've seen some artists, uh, you know, pontificate on the social medias about how, like, if you're not being original, then you're not pushing yourself. I, I would challenge them to actually show me something that's truly original at this point. Yeah. I just think it's really, really hard to do, especially with how saturated we are in pop culture with, you know, every direction we're looking. We got cartoons, movies and all these crazy things with CGI and all this wild stuff. It's just, you know, you, you sort of grab inspiration from what you're surrounded by. And uh, I think every, every creator is borrowing something from something. I know that like drippy slime 90s toy teenage mutant ninja turtles ghostbuster transformer he-man uh x-men comics uh hair metal yeah. bands you know uh the crypt keeper tales from the crypt uh goosebumps are you afraid of the dark like you know barbarian uh you know battles and D dragons like these are all the things that you'll see sort of poke around in in the stuff that i make because i'm a product of the 90s and i you know I was just being bombarded with all of this stuff on the TV and while eating my sugary cereal and looking for toys and, <laughs> <laughs> you know, running around. Yeah. yeah. So you're a creative person. Yeah. So what made you decide to go into the board game kind of scene? What Where's where's your relationship with board games kind of come from? To, well, to your development design side of things with board games, where's that come from? Um. You know, actually, a buddy of mine named Matt P.A. Uh, was he had gone to Unpub maybe like a decade ago and walked out of that after playing a bunch of prototypes. And he had uh, started working on his own board game. And at the time I had like urged him, I had said, like, hey, man, like I do artwork. I don't know anything about making board games, but I would love to make artwork for you. And um, he didn't mm. end up taking me up on that offer. But the idea that I could just make my own board game sort of sat in the back of my head and. Um, and then uh, I was playing Magic the Gathering, as I do. I play D&D and Magic, and the, most of my gaming stuff was sort of lived in that, in that particular genre up until I started getting into the hobby as, a, as not only a designer but as a player. And um, mm. we, had, we were playing these Magic decks that just created all these 1-1 token creatures, and 
I had this idea to make little dice sized miniatures that we ended up calling the token terrors. Um, we designed the minis and we thought they looked great. So we had just seen Gloomhaven break every record in the book. And we were like, okay, well we should make a board game around these guys because they look really neat. And it shouldn't be tough to make a board game. Like we can, we can knock it yeah. out in like six months. And uh, so three years <laughs> was <laughs> it, for us to, for us to design the, the one V one semi abstract skirmish game that is token terrors battlegrounds took us about three and a half years about that time we funded in 2020 and yeah. uh, just getting under the hood with the different mechanisms and the design parameters that we set with token terrors really just sort of woke something up in me and I got this bug and I started designing more games and over lockdown we came up with the ideas for I you know I thought of the concept for black mold and it just kind of snowballed from there is it is it cool to kind of sit back and go I I made this because obviously the, the artwork is 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 a kind of a, a much shorter gestation period so was there points when you're designing the game like token terrors for instance where you're just sitting there going this is just taken this is taking forever. My 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 kids are going to be in high school <laughs> by the time this kind of gets out there. Um, yeah, but you know, <clears throat> I'm um, I have a background in theater as well. Here in Baltimore, there's an organization I co-founded called the Baltimore Rock Opera Society, where we script and right. we script and score all original rock operas from the ground up and use volunteer forces to make costume sets, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I've, I've either co-created, uh, written on scripts or done music on approximately six or seven rock operas. And these are, these are gestation periods, as you put it, that last between three to two years at least. So like the idea of, of like investing in an idea and like really getting your hands dirty and having it take years wasn't like a thing that I was unfamiliar with, um, with the token tears though. I felt like we really, really needed to put the design through its paces because our vision for the brand is to have it go on like forever. We want to be the we want to parallel games like Magic the Gathering or uh, Flesh and Blood or things like that. But we want to be the little guys on a grid version of that where we have a tournament scene where we release a new season of, of factions every year. Uh, we have a player base that's involved, you know, so we really wanted to make sure that design like had very strong foundational structures. Were you, what was it like being at 2020, being pandemic time? How easy or difficult, how easy was it to kind of market, to get the kind of the word out there? I mean, you funded Token Terrors and Token Terrors you funded to the value of about almost $30,000. So how difficult at the time when everybody's kind of like, yeah, I, I like games, but I can't get out and play these damn things. Um... You know, like I mentioned, we had been in the development phase and like sort of like circling the drain on actually launching this thing for about two years where we would name, we would like, you know, proclaim a launch date and then we would delay. We did that two or three times. Mm. Um, but I mean, me and my team, uh, we really cashed in on a lot of social goodwill with Token Terrors because we had been talking about it for so long and we did consider a sort of like you know, postponing until after the pandemic stuff cleared up. But as we can see now mm. in, in you know, hindsight, uh, it didn't really clear up ever. And I'm glad that we launched when we did, because at the time we were like, well, maybe if we wait a little bit longer, you know, this will improve. And I was like, how long are we going to say that, though? Like, what if things never improve and we just delay, 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 delay until it feels like we're sort of like, you know, so let's just do it and pull the trigger. And, you know, it ended up working out. And where are you at the stage with Token Terrors? Is that all out there? Are people now playing it? Have they all got their copies? Yeah, everybody Everybody who backed the campaign has their stuff. Um, you know, we're starting to see a good response from people. Most notably, there's this fella uh, who messaged me and was like, hey, I love the game. I'm going to be taking it with me to a convention this weekend to show other people because it's just awesome. You know, I'm a wow. Warhammer player. I love miniature skirmish games, and this one's just great. It, like checks a lot of boxes but does it in under 40 minutes it's awesome and i was like cool i'm gonna send you an additional copy of the game to demo with and a t-shirt and some swag and blah blah, blah. and dude totally did what he said uh, wow. <laughs> which is just great to see um seeing other people who are not like personally involved with you or involved with you on a business level just evangelizing your game because they just appreciate it is one of the best things to ever happen for our company for real 
Yeah, it's finding your champions. Mm-hmm, exactly. And they they come out they come out of nowhere. And the next thing you do, because we 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 had it at the beginning, and we still do for for the podcast, is you get just the loveliest people just saying, "No, don't worry, I've retweeted this," and or I've I've asked this question if they I've asked this person if they want to come on, and it's like they've not done. It's not like you've said, "Hey, do you mind doing this for us?" They've just like out of their own accord voluntarily, and there's some absolutely lovely people out there that do that and I always say to people if you're looking to build noise and build a voice find who your champions are because they're 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 the person they'll be they'll be out there even when you lose a little bit of heart in yourself they'll be kind of like at the side kind of kind of cheerleading you oh yeah absolutely and and getting responses like that reminds me that like you know token tears is really supposed to be like our flagship product and we we had like mm. a we had like a really great boon with black mold the art package and the and the general conceit that your turn lasts as long as you can hold your breath and it's a horror survival game it garnered enough interest that we got a co-publishing deal um, but that also locked us into a release schedule so like right now it would be great if I could focus all my energy on token tears because we actually have physical product and we have people playing the game but the fact of the matter is is the business arrangement we're in requires me to launch and promote black mold right now let's talk about black mold then sure yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> as much as we did spoke spoke at the spoke at the beginning um no yeah i mean i read that i mean the first thing i read about is like okay your turn lasts as long as you can hold your breath and i was just like that it's just like strange things like that that people kind of go oh why why haven't i done that before or why hasn't anyone else kind of done that before was that a conscious thing that you were looking for john were you out there and going well what can we do that other people don't do or was it straight off the back that the game's black mold and one of the things that everybody says is if you see black mold it can cause respiratory (laughs) illnesses and stuff like that so therefore the best thing for you to be doing is actually holding your breath around black mold sure um yeah, I mean, the, the story is actually pretty... The, the start of Black Mold is very straightforward. I was watching a documentary called Game Masters on Netflix. Uh, a, a, a well-known, um, famous game designer whose name escapes me at the moment said something along, along the lines of, like, you know, achieving real... Uh, we were talking about this earlier. Achieving something that's really original is really, really hard to do. But if you can include something in your game that feels novel, that feels new, this is a great way mm. to get your game noticed. And immediately, it just hit me. A game called Black Mold where you have to hold your breath. That's all I really had at the moment of conception. It just hit me in the side of the head. And I called my co-designer, Phil Docolo, and said, Hey, man, I got an idea. Here's the game. Your turn lasts as long as you can yeah. hold your breath because you're surrounded by black poison clouds of mold spores. We're calling the game Black Mold. It's going to be black metal. It's going to be monochromatic. And that's all I got. And like six days later, he came with the core mechanisms. We got it to the table. We were like astonished that it worked and that it was fun. And uh, we kept developing, developing, developing. And then I got uh-huh. my other business partner and my uh, my spouse, Elizabeth, uh, Lucas, Drace, and Elizabeth. Uh, the three of us have been having a rotating seat of our friends and other game designer people come through and play test it every week. And we're, we're ready to go. <laughs> we're ready to, uh-huh. hit, ready to hit Kickstarter. Yeah. What is it? I mean, it must be strange because have you got other games on the back burner that you've kind of kept on the back burner now because Black Mold kind of works so well? Yeah. Um, yeah, a hundred percent. We would, in all likelihood, if Black Mold wasn't a thing, we would be launching season two of Token Terrors right now. Wow. What was it? What was it about it that McKinnon kind of made you went? No, this is the one we've got to run with this because I'm sure you must have had the discussion um, between everybody to say, you know, this is Token Terrors. We can run with Token Terrors, and we know that we'll get more money coming in it's a good thing it's a steady income or we can go out there with this complete left of field idea and see if it takes up or not uh i mean i'll be i'll be perfectly honest with you i used game design and prototyping and getting new prototypes to the table as a distraction slash coping mechanism during lockdown i had nowhere to go i wasn't playing music all the shows were canceled everybody was staying inside and that meant that work slowed down so i went ahead and just kept my head down and and kind of tried to not think about all the messed up stuff happening and started designing games. Uh, and we have like five games now that are like table ready. I have, I have like art pack, complete arc packages. We play tested them. <laughs> they're ready to hit the table. I'll put them in front of anybody. Um, they're ready to go. But yeah, we have outside of token tears and black mold. Yeah. We have 
four other games that we've made internally that are like table ready to go. Wow. You have no idea at the moment how I'm kind of like fighting the urge to ask you about all your musical theater stuff because I, I I did a lot of I done everything from Gilbert and Sullivan up to the kind of West Side Story. So I'm sitting here like this going, no, he's got to talk about his board game. He's got to talk about his board game. You know, I would. Here's what I would say to that is, check out BaltimoreRockOpera.org. You'll see everything you need to know about what we're doing over here. Uh, we are the world record holders of most original rock operas made by a single entity on Earth. I can... Did they not? Did the guys at the Wire not approach you and say at any point do you fancy like doing a rock opera episode? No, but there <laughs> there is a documentary. Somebody they, there is a documentary about the Bros. Uh, which I th- it was supposed to go to Netflix. I don't know what happened to it, but. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know. We we've been doing more. Um, no, we haven't. We haven't done anything even remotely rooted in reality. The show we're working on right now is called Love and Roar. It's a kaiju rom com. So I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, that sounds amazing. It should be pretty cool. And do you sing then? Are you singing? Are, uh, you, no, are you singing and playing guitar? No, I'm, you, I'm not. I'm not actually. I did the poster for Love and Roar. I'm not like directly involved with the actual production. I just got done working on our last show, Glitterous Dragon Rising. Um. <laughs> I can't even talk. <laughs> that just says ultimately. Just says ultimately amazing. Oh, There's thank you. So you tell you're telling me you don't get up on stage and kind of like sing and play guitar at the same time. Come on. Oh, I mean, I do. I have a band called Cowbunga Pizza Time I, where I do backup vocals. And of vocals. course you do. Of course you do. See, this is yeah. what I'm getting to. You're like, oh no, no, I couldn't possibly like be involved in. That. I don't sing. I just design the posters. And like secretly, you know, you are. And here we go. We found out. I was stripped away that layer of onion. Yeah. I knew you were in a band. Yeah. I played. So I played drums in a stoner metal band called Haze Mage. Um, <laughs> I also play. Of course you do. I play guitar in a in a prog deathcore band called uh, Blight Beast, and um, I uh, I sing and play guitar in a punk party band called Cowbunga Pizza Time. This is that just sounds like you're just making up stuff now. I yeah I I do I I make <laughs> I make up dumb stuff with my friends and then we decide to have it be real and then we do it. This is amazing, isn't it? It's just like, I don't know, we could actually do this. Well, we could do this and then we could pretend or we could dress up like, you know, members of My Little Pony and just run a bit, except we've got Thrash Death Metal. Yeah, that sounds work. What are we going to call uh, ourselves? Death Metal Pony. Dude, that, you know, you, if you did that, the br- the brony scene, the, all the My Little Pony people would love that. I think it's just, I think, I think it's just like, we're literally like half an hour away from making that happen. Do it. You know. There's a whole pile of other podcast episodes we could just make together, just you and me going through <laughs> these various different things. We just make shit up. We just make stuff up yeah. all the time. I mean, this is, you know, this is, I have like, that's what I get called on all the time. It's like, I keep on coming up with ideas for games and then just putting out there. And then somebody will message me and going, when are you going to make that game? And it's like, I'm never going to make that game because of what I said earlier on, because I would never ever get it finished because I'd be perpetually trying to improve it. Going back to Black Mold, yeah. Coming back because we've done this is like an orbital journey. Every now and again, we'll actually orbit back round again and start talking about what we're meant to be talking about. Sure. How do you take a turn? What's what kind of game is it? Is you know? Um. So this game is a game you play to play, not play to win. It's about it's about player interaction. It's about table talk. It's about negotiation, betrayal, and mm-hmm. just trying to survive. So the way you take a turn. Is uh you're gonna take you're gonna take damage every turn. So every every character has uh, sixteen like health spaces and then a varying number of death spaces. Where if they get covered, you'll either change into a thrall or you'll be murdered and eliminated from the game. Um, but as you traverse, as you move through the toxic tunnels of the compound, you're gonna take damage in the form of spores that are gonna obfuscate different symbols on your vitality track that are going to limit your ability. So you're going to roll less dice. You're going to start adding confusion cards to your decision deck. And it's kind of hard to explain the abstract like verbally, but basically um, you, you, may, you might want to heal at the top of your turn. You might not. After that, you can inter, inter, interact with other players so you can trade uh, items or you can threaten other players and be like, hey, give me all your stuff or I'll stab you. Or you can hire them to protect you from other stuff. Uh, you can craft or ditch items. And then you're going to take a deep breath. <sighs> And while you're doing that, you're going to look at different numbers on area cards that are going to indicate one of two things. The number of decision cards you have to reveal in order to move through it. And this is a horizontal tableau of different, like, 
death metal tendril lines that you have to connect into a quote unquote neural path in order to move forward. Um, or you're going to be chucking dice in order to meet and accrue a search check number on that card. Uh, and But every time you roll the dice, the chance of spore damage is, is there, so you might end up taking a lot of damage if you keep on searching too much. Um, and basically the name of the game is get items, craft them, use them to survive and make it through the compound alive, or uh, maybe get murdered, uh, or you could get a paranoid infection. There's a lot of different things. There's some light hidden roll stuff, but the, the experience is like kind of tense, Harrowing is a good word for it, um, and uh, but it's it's also really fun because you're sort of you're in this co-op till you're not sort of mindset where like you're happy to work with the other players until it doesn't really work out for you to do that anymore. And then it's kind of like treachery galore. Yeah, I mean, you want to be careful though, because the one of the really fun parts of the game is that when you die from from spore exposure, you don't get eliminated you flip your character card over and now you're a murderous fungal thrall and your win condition is to prevent the other players from escaping and not only are not only do you no longer have to hold your breath you also get access to a deck of seven special like like fungal thrall cards that make you really efficient at at hunting down and killing the other players that sounds amazing i love the hold breath a holding breath mechanic sounds kind of fun fantastic but there's a i like the cut the cutthroatedness of it as well i think there's been a the kind of a raft of games that you kind of they're, they're a little bit against kind of plymouth player elimination well yeah we and i think if play i think if it's done right it can be done well yeah our our, our player elimination mechanic is it's really about the players who are not be on death's door having a conversation being like mm. listen Nobody wants you to die, okay? But the fact of the matter is, is that if you do die and you turn into a fungal thrall, you're going to come and kill us. So it's nothing personal, but like I'm making a decision to now take you out of the game because I I th- I am threatened by what you will do if you don't survive. And then that player is now thinking to themselves, well, I don't want to be eliminated of the game, so I'm going to purposefully make sure that I take spore damage so I can turn into a thrall because these pieces of crap are trying to kill me. <laughs> <laughs> but there's also like think about like in the Goonies or like has any, it been any of the, like I I like to think of like we've also had players come in who are like super duper positive and super supportive from the jump and they're just like look let's just stick together and take care of each other and we'll like we'll get out like if we all agree to do this from the beginning we will all get out alive so like let's mm-hmm. do that so it kind of fits the both things. If everybody does want to be fully cooperative, they can be fully cooperative. Yeah, but if you somebody can, halfway you can make, through decides, you can make nah. that happen. That sounds pretty cool. Has it been easy to explain that and pitch that to people? Um, I mean, you've got a lot of stuff going on. There's kind of the whole holding your breath stuff, and then there's like the player elimination stuff. Is it? I mean, you sound like you've obviously practiced this in a mirror. How to explain about how to play the game? Um, but as you know, have you? Has it been easy to kind of pitch this to to new players to kind of get them interested and get them kind of involved? Uh, yeah, because our our main tagline that I have said a hundred times probably is it's an immersive co-op till it's not survival horror escape where your turn lasts as long as you can hold your breath. If they're in after that, I don't need to sell them anymore. That tells them everything they need to know. That'll if 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 that interests them enough to a- ask any more questions, then we're getting the game to the table. You ever had anybody just like hold their breath that long and that they just collapse to the side and then no. you've had to get rid of a body, John? No, no, that's never happened. It's really hard to hold your breath to the point where you pass out. And actually, it's good for your health to practice holding your breath, which I did not know until a bunch of people were throwing shade <laughs> at us online <laughs> because our game has a breath really? holding mechanic. You always, there's always one idiot on the internet, isn't there? I don't know if they're idiots. I can you kind of it. understand. Somebody was like, you're going to get somebody killed. And I was like, dude, can you please chill? Like, <laughs> no, we're not. That's absurd. Um, and then somebody was like, oh, well, this is this is not cool because of people with breathing difficulties. And we were like, all right, well, we include a 60-second sand timer if you don't feel like holding your breath. There's still a real time. Exactly. Yeah, like, oh. the real time side of the game is still very frantic and still very, like, your cognitive load is getting bombarded no matter what you do, but it's definitely way more intense and way more immersive if you do, if you, you know, if you're a good sport and you hold your breath. 
These are quite literally people that have never, ever, 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 ever dealt with a toddler. Who is in a tantrum, who looks at you and goes, <gasps> breathes in, doesn't start breathing out. And you're just like, what are you doing? It's like I'm having a tantrum at you. I'm holding my breath. It's like, you're going to pass out then. Uh-huh. No, I'm not. No. You could do a toddler version of this, John. I don't. I don't know. I don't. I don't know if toddlers have the cutthroat mentality you need to survive in the world of black mold. I don't know. You've been through school. You don't know what kids are. Kids could be vicious sometimes. <laughs> kids. I. Do you know what? I reckon kids would introduce like a kind of a poking somebody else on the ribs mechanic. Are you holding your breath? Are you? You're not now, are you? There you go. Yeah, try to that's your breath. Try to hold your breath. That's going to be our next game where while you're taking your turn, all the other players are going to fling stuff at your head. They're just gonna, they're just gonna throw stuff at you while you're trying to think. I wasn't gonna be that. I wasn't gonna be that violent. I wasn't like. I mean, you've taken it to the dark. You've did, you're going somewhere, Anakin. I can't follow. Yeah. Um. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't. I wasn't. You know, I was talking about like maybe a gentle poke in the ribs. I wasn't talking about you like like giving people mild full length concussion <laughs> so while they're playing. Oh, no, no, no. These will be little foam custom shaped things that you'll, I don't know, right. you'll draft them into a bag and draw them at random and based on how many land on the table some stuff will happen. But during your opponent's turn you're just going to be flinging foam at them the entire time to distract that them. That sounds amazing. Oh, uh, yeah. That sounds yeah, amazing. you know. Yeah, we're going to, I don't know how much more of the these like eyebrow raising like tagline gimmick things we're going to chase down. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> For right now, I hope the breath holding thing is enough to get people interested. I think it'll certainly be interesting to see. I want to see. I want to see live playthroughs. Um, I want to see. I want to see certain YouTubers just see who they can hold their breath for as long as possible, <laughs> not for any reason. Just hold your breath. Mm-hmm. Go and let's see. How, <laughs> let's see how long they can. Let's see how long they can. They can do it. Um, one of the things that's come up over the last. 18 months, which you'll be more than aware of, is the whole kind of manufacturing and shipping situation, which I'm pretty sure everybody that's back to Kickstarter of late has had that email saying, sorry guys, but um, you know, you've got more chance of growing udders and getting milked than getting our game kind of sent to you. Um, was that a consideration for yourself as well in terms of manufacturing? Did you, I mean, are you are you looking at getting... Um, Blackmore going to be manufactured in China or did you look at kind of other places to get it manufactured as well? Um, <clears throat> so this is just the truth from my perspective as a newer indie publisher manufacturing anywhere, but mm. China is as financially sort of uh, uncertain as manufacturing in China and dealing with international mm. freight and shipping. Um, the, just the way the, the decrease in cost and the expertise and the experience that the Chinese manufacturers have is just it's it's worlds different from any of the things that I've tried to source uh, in in North America. If I was doing a card game, I would manufacture in the states. That's about it. Why? Do you, why do you think that is? Because I've looked at the costs. Like if if you're doing a game with miniatures, you're making your game in China. That's all. Um, mm-hmm. with black mold, uh, we, so we're actually part of a, um, a, oh gosh, it's like, uh, I can't remember what it's called. It's called the Indie Gamers Alliance, Indie Board, Indie Board Game yeah. Publishers Alliance. So, yeah. uh, w- since we're, since we're like a, a paid, a paid member of their organization, we get discounts with certain manufacturers and they have mm-hmm. a really good, uh, reputation or they have a really good, uh, relationship with this manufacturer called Maja and we get 7% off of our wholesale order for manufacturing costs, which is crazy. Um, that's amazing yeah so there's that and also um we worked with this guy named matt holden who is this totally awesome dude who will make your your gaming insert storage stuff for a for a deluxe version of the game and like i don't Mm -hmm. know like i think it might have been like 200 bucks was like if you feel like paying me i'll take 200 bucks otherwise i'm happy to just take you know the best pledge that you offered during the campaign and um i asked him like did he you know did he have any additional information for me he was like if you are thinking about using Maja, absolutely use them because they do great insert work. And I was like, okay. So, you know, also Maja's doing some really cool stuff with eco-friendly card materials. And yeah, their, their costs, especially when you scale above like 2,000 units, are just like so competitive that it's not even a, it's not even a question. 
did it did it had any influence on the kind of like the price that you're offering the pledges at then um yeah i still need to crunch the numbers right now we're hovering between 50 and 60 bucks i still have to figure out some stuff but you know the yeah. the general rule of thumb that people say in this industry is you it, it used to be times five cost now it's like times mm-hmm. six point five or times seven cost is what you're really looking at if you're if you're gonna try and like give yourself a parachute for shipping and freight nonsense. Has it been different in your approach to marketing? Because I made a joke at the very very beginning before we recorded that you know you'll be you'll be like the podcast darling kind of going about <laughs> kind of saying hello to multiple people. Yeah. But do you, do you actually feel like say you know. That you know the the movie star that's going around from chat show to chat show, kind of having to tell your life story just to be able to talk about your game for five minutes. Uh, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't really consider it like a celebrity thing. I mean, it's avenues like this to be able to talk about you know what interests me in the in the hobby and in the industry, and also just chat with another person who's also interested in those things. That is all great, and it's also awesome to be afforded the ability to promote my stuff. Um, so I'm, I have to do it because, like, for us, a small little scrappy company, you know, we only got a couple thousand dollars to run the marketing campaign on this thing. We're not one of those big monolithic companies yeah. that, you know, have a, a $60,000 marketing budget. Um, so I got to get it where I can get it, you know? Yeah. What's it been like with... Um... Have you had a, did you get, or are you getting in the process of getting kind of like a lot of some kind of marketing videos and stuff kind of made? Yeah. Um, because there's face, there's Facebook groups out there that you, you get somebody saying, right, okay, here's my new game. Who wants, who'd like a preview copy? And the next thing you know, there's about 20 million comments sure. <laughs> saying, you know, you know, tabletop donuts would love a copy, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, candles and meeples would love a copy. Um, what's your experience been like with these people? I mean, have they all been kind of cool to work with? Have you had to nudge others along to kind of get the kind of content together? Is it, you know, what's the experience kind of been like overall? Um, it's real tricky because at least in my experience, you know, the smaller channels that don't ask you to pay them kind of have the ability to just do whatever they want. There's, there's not, there's not really any accountability. And they, they might do a really good job. Some sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But because there isn't mm-hmm. a because there isn't an expectation set to a price, um yeah. whatever they make is what they make, you know? And yeah. you can ask them not to post it, and I think a lot of times, you know, they would probably they would probably respect that. Um I prefer working with the content creators that charge. They have a number of packages they offer. They have yeah. they have a notable audience size. I like to see somebody above three thousand followers on any given social media channel, and yeah. they tell you like, if you send the game by this time, we will produce X content for you by this time, and we will understand mm-hmm. the game, we will know the rules, and we will give you this product in return. Um, so yeah, uh, we're, you can you were talking about watching a, a playthrough. We'll be on we'll be on Quacklope's YouTube channel. He invited me over to his house for a couple days, and we did a bunch of content for the for the game there. Um, yeah. Learn to play <clears throat> is going to be doing an overview video, and uh, oh geez, not man, no, who is it? Oh, Unfiltered Gamer is also doing some content for us. Oh yeah, I know them. Yeah, I know Jesse. I've never, do you know what? I've never had Jesse on the podcast. And it's not because I don't like him, <laughs> or that I've got the fear of ducks. Uh huh. You, you have a fear of ducks? No, no, that's just no, no. They make me sad. I feel a little bit down in the mouth when I deal them. Um, but um, no, it didn't land. Um, uh, but no, yeah, no. It's at least one of the things that stars has never aligned. I kind of took a little bit of mini break from podcasting, and uh, I know that Jesse's been podcasting, and it's always been a kind of a mean to kind of get him back on because I saw this is a guy that came from nowhere, and all of a sudden his channel's got like fifty squillion subscribers, and um, I'm jealous, John. I'll be honest. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I know very, the you know, feeling. I know the feeling. But you know, he's he, I, whatever, whatever he did, it's working. And I'll tell you this: like, um, he absolutely did not need to invite me into his house dude is super nice like he we ran into each other at pax and he was like i was telling him about mm. black mold he was like sounds cool man like if you ever want to come by mm. and shoot some stuff let me know 
And I was like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, well, we yeah, we had, yeah, we had yeah. worked together in the Token Terrorist campaign when he was still, I think, under like three thousand subs. Um, yeah. I I had given him his rate, which I think was like I don't know three or four hundred bucks or something like that. And um, yeah, he did coverage for Token Terrorist. That was awesome. He had, had great B roll. All this good stuff. Um, and then we yeah. we kind of kept talking throughout the year. So after his channel like blew up, I was kind of like taken aback that he was like, yeah, you can come by. We'll shoot some stuff. Um, but he absolutely like followed through and did exactly what he said. It was awesome. I had a ton of fun over there. That's good. Yeah, I need to get him on someday, but I don't know. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow, but soon, and for the rest of his I'll life, we shall have to see. Don't do that, because he'll just say, who? <laughs> oh, that guy? No, I don't like him. The wizard boy, that's what he calls me. You know, there's beef. There's not real beef. It's more like... Chicken? Duck. Chicken. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's a good... That's a kind of, that's a kind of a good thing. So, you're talking about $50, $60, roughly, for the pledge level. Mm -hmm. Um, at time of recording, the game is going to be on Kickstarter around about the twentieth of October or October twentieth. If you're in the United, if you're on the United States, basically. Um, if people want to find out more about the game, where can they find you? And where do you exist on the internet webs, John? Uh, if you want to learn about Black Mold, you can go to blackmoldgame.com. Uh, okay. If you want to learn about our other stuff that we have happening, you can go to terriblegames.info. Uh, we are oh. at Token Terrors on Instagram, and I am on Twitter, but I never use it. And I'm mostly floating around on Facebook talking to other board game people, and uh, we have a Terrible Games group on there that I, I try to engage with on a semi-regular basis. Um, and yeah. Yeah, we're on YouTube also if you want to follow us there. We post, uh, you know, like our promo videos and sometimes like playthroughs and other stuff on there. Cool. And what we'll do is we'll take all this information and all these leaks and then we'll put them on our on our show notes so that we've got notes to show. Um, if you want to follow us, you just go to the lo local places. Uh, Fallout races, bright and early for the daily races. No disgraces. It's... Twitter is We're Not Wizards, Facebook is We're Not Wizards if you want the page and you can go to the group there's a hidden group which the secret magic people come along and chat to us and you can ask to join there but I might just turn you away. Um, we've got Instagram at We're Not Wizards, we're on our blog which is we're not wizards .co uk, and we've got the website which you can find all the rest of the podcast episodes on we're not wizards com. if you like what you've listened to today then please consider going to the apples of the podcasts and dropping us a rating or a review. If you are going to be giving us a rating or a review, remember, don't give us 10 stars because it makes me big-headed and ego is a terrible thing. But don't give me one star because it makes me cry. Give me something like five because it's in the middle and it's average and I'm um, a little bit average. Um, but the person... Who's not been average? It's rather wonderful, rather fantastic. Is uh, you'll need to get some kind of bleach type mold reducing thing to get rid of him. He's hanging around your shower right now. It's Mr. John De Campos. <laughs> Richard, thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. Uh, there's only two more things to do. The first thing is to remember that we're many things, but we're not wizards. Are we wizards, John? Uh, I don't know. I'd like to think I'm sort of a wizard. I just thought, okay, well, I'm going to delete the entire episode. <laughs> uh, no, I'm not a wizard. Um, and then, that's better. I only took you like a 50% chance of getting the answer right. Got it wrong first thing. Obviously, black mold affects your brain. Um, and the second thing is to say goodbye. So it's, it's a goodbye from John. Say goodbye, John. Adios, amigos. He's coming along with that foreign... American stuff. And it's a goodbye for me. Remember, uh, stay safe, roll sixes, um, make something awful. And remember, if you see the black mold coming for you, think about your options, think about your decisions. And while you're doing it, try to hold your breath. But don't try and hold your breath too much because otherwise something horrible might come out of the shadows at you. Goodbye. A wizard is never late.
Nor is he early. He arrives precisely when he means to. 